people complicate their lives so for nothing, for an illusory identity. <laughs> and then what is left then is things are as they are at this moment. People do what they do at this moment. Beautifully illustrated in the story that you may have heard perhaps through this mouth before. In the story of the Zen master, some of you probably don't know it, so, but it's such a beautiful story. The Zen master, who had an excellent reputation as a great teacher in a town in Japan, and one day was accused by the 17-year-old girl next door of being the father to her, um, her child that had just been born. The parents asked, who is the father? They were shocked that she was giving birth to a baby. And she finally said, it was the master next door. I went to see him nine months ago for a spiritual counseling session. And then that's when he did it to me. And so the parents, the parents got extremely angry and started telling everybody about it. And they ran to the Zen master and with the baby and put it there on his floor and said, we know what you did. You are responsible. Now you look after the baby. We don't want anything to do with this baby anymore. You take it. You are the father. We know it all now. The Zen master looked and listened. And when they said, you are the father of this baby, he said, is that so? And then they said, yes, and we are leaving this baby here. You can look after him. Is that so? Then they left. The Zen master lost his reputation. Nobody came to him for counseling sessions anymore. Nobody wanted to hear him anymore. All he had there was the baby. So that was the present moment. He picked up the baby and started getting some food, sent, sent off somebody to get some food and spent one year mostly looking after the baby that was there. A year later, the girl was a little bit more mature and cuddly confessed to her parents that the Zen master was actually not the father. It was the, the, the son of the butcher next door was the father. So, oh my God, they ran to the Zen master and said, please forgive us, that is all a big mistake. We've just realized that you are not the father. The Zen master looked and said, is that so? And they said, oh, oh, can we have the baby back now, please? We now want the baby. We'll look after it. So uh, we want the baby back. Is that so? Okay. Yeah. And off they went. This is an extreme example of the good that comes, only good, when no story, even stories that other people try to impose on you, is accepted. No story is taken on. And this then is an extreme example of, it's a, it's a teaching story, it's an extreme example of a non-reactive relationship to life and a non-story imposing relationship on life. They had their story. They had to do, they had to make the Zen master wrong. The Zen master refused any kind of story, any kind of, he wasn't a victim of circumstance. He didn't say, I can't look after this baby. What do I do? I, I can't have spent my time. Look. No, he did what was there to do at that moment. So the baby had the best possible start in life because for one year grew up in this energy field of great peace with the Zen master. But then the Zen master did not cling, did not have a clinging relationship to that. He was able to, in the moment, let go of the past and relinquished the baby and responded to this moment. The parents now, he so genuinely wanted the baby back. He, she was going to marry the butcher's son. So. This is an example of the simplicity. It, it may be a little bit extreme. You can, def you, you can, of course, say, no, I am not the father. There would be another possibility that is still not a story. 
No, I'm not the father, but if that is what you believe, I cannot help it. Again, you're not buying into the story. But if you had your own, then people, you have a, you have a, a story to, f to counteract their story, and so on, and so on. The stuff out of which drama is made. So look at your life and see. Are you facing situations as they are? Are you, or are you imposing and mixing up something here? Stories on simpl the simplicity that is always there in this moment. So that is, it's good to know that because the mind will always try to manufacture stories. And the biggest one, of course, the most intriguing story, is the story of me, me and my life. That's so interesting. <laughs> and if you can't tell anybody else about me and my life, then you can tell yourself about me and my, much about my life. Oh, uh, the story of me. The most fascinating story, and uh, the story of me is part of the ego, the egoic sense of self. Not saying that you you do not remember remember what happened to you. Of course, you remember what happened to you. Not saying don't have the photo albums anymore. You still have the photo albums, but to derive your identity from a story. And when you look at the story of me, they can see that a lot of the identity that is derived from the story of me is to do very often with making other people wrong and see how right you have been in that situation and how wrong those people have been to you compared to all situations or God, him, her or itself, God itself has done something to you. And so attached to the story are certain emotions, resentments, they, the story is enormously energized by resentments, and anger, sadness, they did to me, they did to me, kinds of things. Look, can you look through the story? and die to the story, N not, not lose your memory, but die to the story as a self-reference, as, as, as giving you your sense of self. So where does your sense of self come from then, if you let go of that, if you die to that, and see that's not who you are, and you die to the unconsciousness of manufacturing further stories, even complaining, let's go back to the example of the cold soup. Complaining about the cold soup is another story. The moment you complain about it, I'm not saying, saying heat it up please, that's not complaining. But the inner complaining or the outer verbal complaining, which implies making something or someone wrong, that's the story. So drama, people, unconscious people are waiting just for the next thing out of which they can manufacture drama. The egoic identity in conjunction with the pain body is just looking out for the next thing out of which to manufacture their next dramatic episode. Now the kind of dramas that people are drawn into vary a little. Some people have the victim drama, somebody's always doing it to me, other people have other kinds of drama, they get very angry with situations and people. Others, we get very sad, poor me, well that's the victim. I can't remember what else, there's there quite a few. <laughs> and then you see how they use the tiniest events to add a little bit to incorporate into their dramatic story. So if you can see that in others, that's already great. If you can see it in yourself, it's even greater. 
when it happens. See it. And so you see what that is. Some people have a greater amount of a denser, a more dense, a denser ego and a denser pain body than others. But the, the, the basic principle is there in everyone to some extent, greater or lesser. But it ceases to operate the more you step into presence. Then there's still only remnants of that that occasionally come in. And then your life becomes simplified, so simple. Simplify, simplify, said one famous writer. Sorrow, I think it was. Simplify, simplify. Now people talk about simplifying their lives and they think it's to do with not indulging in excessive consumption and so on which of course is good too but that happens naturally the true simplification happens on the inner level let go of the stories pay more attention to this moment than anything else This is the day that we spend in silence, the day that we spend listening, always just this moment. It sounds like a big thing if we say we'll spend the whole day listening, watching, being alert, attentive, alert to your surroundings and alert on the inner level. The more alert you are to sense perceptions, the more alertness you will also have within. Stay for a little while with the empty chair. Thank you. This concludes Lesson 4. Lesson 5, Questions and Answers. Being present amidst the world. I've never had so many questions at a retreat. <laughs> and I'm not here to flatter you. The best question, of course, is no question. But I have never had as many good questions so it's difficult. They all are, most of them are good questions, direct, alive, live questions. I've never thrown away any questions yet. I keep even the silliest question might come in useful at some point. (laughs) 
I will dip my hand in the basket in a second. One question that came three or four times. There are a few recurring questions. Can we sit with you in silence for a while? Yes. When you're just listening, there's stillness inside you. No commentary. So don't miss the stillness that's actually there even when the words are spoken here. Both in you and in the speaker. There's no thinking in between sentences or words. So whenever a word has been uttered, the stillness is there again. Who is speaking? Not this person or this little mind. Stillness is speaking. It's not personal, not my stillness or your stillness. And I said before, this person is listening the same as you to the words. This person doesn't know what word is going to be spoken next as little as you know what word is going to be spoken next. It's not prepared. To trust in life enough for this to happen. To trust in life means to trust in this moment, the power of this moment. That whatever this moment requires will be there. There were also two or three questions by people to whom the stillness is yet only a mental concept. And so they ask, it's great to hear about it, but I've never experienced the stopping of my mind. My mind is continuously noisy, compulsive. It continuously worries and thinks. So what are you what can you tell me? they ask. There are also a few questions on meditation, the use, the purpose, usefulness, or otherwise of meditation. 
And I'd like to bring the two together, the two questions. Especially if the mind is incessantly active, even here, as you sit here. If you cannot notice the gaps, if you cannot be attentive to the gaps, now make sure that this is actually the truth, because you may actually notice the gaps for a moment there may be a momentary cessation but because you're so used to listening to your mind to the mind is saying no nothing is going on I don't get it maybe you do briefly however it may be if your mind is such overpowering momentum meditation is a wonderful thing there is a meditation there are different methods one could say of course that being in the body is a kind of meditation feeling the inner body directing attention into the inner body is a kind of meditation the way it's presented here is in a non-formal, formalized way. I just feel that. And it may be that people whose mind is extremely, extremely active may need a somewhat more formal approach to being in the body. And so there's a beautiful meditation technique, Vipassana, that directs your attention slowly and gradually into the body. So that would be a good thing to take up the practice of that. There are also mantras if used rightly, they should stop the mind and replace all the various mental activities with just that, the mantra. And eventually, of course, the mantra needs to come to an end and then the stillness is there. Buddhism has designed for hopeless cases the counting meditation. <laughs> Not hopeless, no. <laughs> Where you count mentally from 1 to 10 and 10 to 1, or, or I think maybe you start at 100, I don't remember. But you just, you count backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and then that gives your mind something to do but at least it becomes more focused and once the chaos of the mind has become a, a more focused kind of noise it's easier eventually to drop it once the chaotic noise has become focused noise, you can more easily drop, the f once the noise has become focused, then you could drop the chaos. It's hard to drop the chaos, except in great suffering. The aim of all meditation, of course, is presence.
eventually any technique needs to be let go of. If there's anybody here who feels angry at that statement, it's a good sign that it's time to let go. Because there's a new identification with form, my method that I'm so good at, that I've spent 20 years getting better at, So Vipassana is excellent. They claim, and it may well be true, whether they have some sutras to prove it, but who knows how old they are, but it may well be true that Vipassana is one of the original meditations taught by the Buddha. But it seems that the Buddha also taught another meditation that is breath awareness. And that can be practiced not just as a meditation that when you sit in a particular way, but to be aware of your breathing is a, a related already to being in the body because the breath flows into the body. To notice your breath, to feel your in and out breath, is helpful. It does bring you into the now. When you do it for any length of time, you soon encounter the threshold of boredom, because observing your breath is not interesting. And then, if you stay with it, you will pass through the threshold of boredom. And then observing your breath is quite peaceful. The coming and going. And you notice great subtleties about your breath. You notice, for example, that at the end of each out-breath, there's a momentary cessation.